Okay, uh, welcome everyone to class one and uh, hope you're excited to do this course, uh, Doctoral Foundations. Uh, we just wait for a couple of them to more, uh, join. I'm not sure how many of them have enrolled for this class. I should have checked, but uh, I did not do that. Uh, but thank you all for uh, joining in this uh, for this class. Uh, before we begin, uh, we'll just uh, uh, start with a word of prayer. So can somebody lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Yes. Thank you, success. Father, we thank you. We want to say blessed be your holy name. Thank you for this new section. Thank you for working out this morning. Thank you because you are the reason why we are alive. Be that glorified in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask you this morning that we commence our lecture, Father. Oh God, help us in the name of Jesus. Let your word of God share this morning, sink into our life and turn our life around in the name of Jesus. And we ask, O oh Lord, that Lord visit our lecturer with the wisdom, with the power of the Holy Spirit, in the mighty name of Jesus. And all the students will commit to a good end that we started where we will finish this course well, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, my Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, success. Okay, so... Uh... Today is uh, the first class for doctrinal foundations. So when you think of doctrinal foundations, or when you looked at this course named Doctrinal Foundations, uh, Systematic Th Theology, what came to your mind? What were your thoughts? I'm sure you would have thought something you'd like to share. Yeah, um, I thought it's about the foundation of theology and its studies and more, much more about the background and everything. Okay, thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else? Ma'am, uh, uh, it could be a foundation like for a Christian. Okay. Christian foundation as a Christian, as a believer. Okay, thank you, Rosalyn. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, go ahead, Lubega. I also thought of uh, you know, when I saw the the other name, which was in the in quotation, I saw systematic theology. This made me think that uh, we shall have to deal with so many other branches of theology. Okay. Yes, John, you were going to say something. Oh yeah, so I meant. Um, so we're going deep into the um, revelation that we already have, uh, the salvation, the, uh, all the doctrines, um, but we are going in depth of each of the things which we do believe and to have a firm grip on it. Okay. To have a firm grip on what we believe. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so when we think about this word theology, what comes to your mind? You think of theology, what comes to your mind? What are your thoughts? It's study about God. Okay, study about God. Thank you, Rosalyn. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, there are okay. two words there. There are two words there, Theos and Logos. Thanks for God and Lagos for reason or discourse of the study as they used to tell us. So it's all about the start of God. Okay. Okay, thank you. Have you done uh, theological courses before, Lubega? I really did, but I did not get accreditation. Okay. So that's why you know what's meaning of theology. Okay. Or you read up your notes if you're a good student. Okay. Anyone else? Yes. Um, my own um, theology is study about God. Okay. <laughs> study and know details about God. Thank you, success. 
Okay, so uh, theology, the English word comes from the Greek word theologia, which is derived from two words, theos and logia. So theos meaning God and logia meaning utterance or saying. Uh, we need to make a distinction here. It's not logos, okay? It's not theologos, it's theologia. So logos means the word, okay? So uh, when we translate John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. We're saying in the beginning was theos and the theos was logos, Okay, so the word is logos, but here it's not logos, but it is logia, which means utterance or saying. So basically, theology is the study or the teaching or the utterance and the sayings about God. Okay, so theology is basically the teaching, the study, the utterance, the sayings about God. Now, in systematic theology, we basically answer this question, what does the whole Bible teach us today about a specific topic? So if you want to study any topic or any doctrine, can it be, can be sin, salvation, grace, prayer, um, any topic, then you would you know, uh, want to do a systematic study. When you do a systematic study, you're looking at all the references and all the scripture portions that talk about that specific topic and look at it in the entirety and not just pull out one or two verses from here and there and come to some conclusions or, um, you know, come to some um, uh, uh, basic foundations of your faith because that can be a little um, dangerous uh, because, you know, when we look at one or two passages and take that in isolation and kind of make our own uh, faith statements or uh, build our own theology, then that can be a little shaky, that can be a little dangerous as well, but it's important to look at all of the scripture in entirety to see what the whole of scripture, Old and New Testament is talking about that specific topic. So that is what we're going to do in systematic theology. We're going to look at what the entire Bible, the entire scripture teaches us today about any given topic. So this definition of systematic theology, which I just said is a study of what the whole Bible teaches us today about a specific topic, this definition indicates that systematic theology is a study which involves collecting and understanding all the relevant passages in the Bible on one specific topic or on various topics and then summarizing the teaching clearly so that you know what you believe about each topic. Okay, I'll say that again. So the definition that I said about systematic theology indicates that in systematic theology, the study involves basically collecting, okay, looking up all the scripture passages, collecting all the references, understanding uh, those passages in the light of the context, in the uh, light of the historical context, the social, cultural context that was written, and then, you know, um, uh, you know, understanding it in that context and uh, then summarizing their teachings clearly so that uh, you know what you believe about that specific topic. Now, in systematic theology, we incorporate biblical, historical, and sometimes philosophical teaching uh, into its methodology. So if you're going to do a very uh, deep systematic way of studying a specific topic, then you just not only look at the biblical passages, but you will also look at, you'll incorporate um, historical, philosophical uh, theology in the methodology of studying that specific topic. Now, having said that, I'll, I'll explain what is historical theology. It's basically, uh, it's a historical study of how Christians in different periods of time have understood, uh, you know, different theological topics. So if you're looking at sin and you want to do a deeper study than just looking at the references in the Bible, you will also go into doing a historical study at looking at how various theologians 
uh, or various people have, uh, uh, or philosophers have uh, spoken about sin or salvation or grace uh, uh, or whatever topic that you're looking for. So historical uh, theology is, uh, it's a historical study of how Christians in different periods have understood various theological topics. Then philosophical theology is uh, studying theology uh, or theological topics largely uh, without using the Bible. So, you know, uh, people who have done uh, studied philosophy, uh, philosophical theology, they don't use the Bible, but they use various tools and um, methods in philosophy that is reasoning. One is philosophical reasoning. Uh, and the other is what can be known about God by just observing nature and how uh, nature works, the cause and the effects. So we can look at, uh, if you want to do a deeper study in systematic theology, you can also look at uh, philosophical theology and what uh, uh, philosophers have spoken or said about um, a specific topic. And then we have apologetics. Now, apologetics is basically providing a defense of, uh, for the truth, that we believe the truthfulness of the Christian faith for the purpose of convincing unbelievers. Okay, so that is apologetics. Uh, don't be appalled by all these big words. Okay, it's just very simple. So apologetics is basically when you're talking to an unbeliever, and uh, you know you're trying to defend the truth in uh, 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 about Jesus Christ, about the Scripture. You're defending that. So you know you've done a good study, and you're able to quote Scripture, say things in a way that will convince an unbeliever uh, of their unbelief. And then we have Old Testament theology, which is very simple. So if you're studying systematic theology with, and a specific topic, you would like to look at uh, Old Testament and see uh, what uh, the Old Testament talks about that specific topic. So, for example, if you're looking at studying prayer, then you will look at uh, what the, uh, the whole of the Old Testament is talking about prayer and then come to a certain conclusion based on the entirety of the Old Testament. In the same way, New Testament theology uh, is, you know, answers questions like what does the Gospel of John teach on prayer or what does the New Testament teach on prayer, okay? So these are some of uh, the uh, disciplines of theology, uh, historical, philosophical, apologetics, New Testament and uh, sorry, Old Testament and New Testament theology that we can incorporate or integrate uh, in our methodology of studying systematic uh, theology. Now, having said that, you know, um, uh, even though we look at the historical and philosophical studies, uh, which can contribute to our understanding of uh, theological question or a specific topic that we are studying, but it's only scripture, it's only the word of God, it's only the Bible that has the final authority to define what we believe. And so it's therefore appropriate for us to spend more time focusing on, on the process of analyzing and understanding scripture and its teaching in its context and coming to a rightful conclusion. And of course, we have uh, the help of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who teaches us, who reveals uh, the truth in God's word to us, and he will teach us and he will guide us. Okay. So do you have any doubts on what um, we said in the introduction about what systematic theology is and what are the other disciplines we would incorporate to use while studying systematic theology. So anyone has any doubts? Any questions? Any comments to make? Was it clear? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So we look at uh, we're looking at doctrinal foundations. So we'll um, see what is the meaning of doctrine. So what do you think is doctrines? When you think of this word doctrines, what comes to your mind? Yeah. <laughs> Principles or laws governing something. Uh, sorry, can you say that again, please? I say that doctrine, when we talk about doctrine, the, the aspect of principles or laws governing something. 
comes to the mind. Okay, principles or laws that govern something. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so Subhas is said that what I believe about something. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, doctrine is a belief or a set of beliefs that a person holds. Uh, something that person believes, something that the person has understood and has believed. And it can also be something that uh, is taught by someone. So in other terms, uh, doctrines are teachings. Okay, doctrines are teaching. So you're basically teaching somebody what you believed, uh, what you understood, and you're sharing that with someone else. So in systematic theology, uh, doctrine is what the whole Bible teaches us today about a particular topic. Okay, so this is what was understood uh, by uh, the writers and how the Holy Spirit uh, imparted into their, uh, their spirit man and what they have written and how the Holy Spirit has led them to write their understanding. And so we are uh, in, in, in systematic theology, we are looking at what the whole Bible teaches us about a specific uh, or a particular topic or a particular doctrine. Okay. Now, how do we uh, study uh, systematic theology? Okay, how do we study systematic theology? Any idea? How do we study systematic theology? I already said it. Uh, it's basically studying the whole Bible, right? It's basically looking at what the whole Bible in its entirety is talking about one specific uh, topic. So uh, uh, how do we study systematic theology? It's very simple. Uh, in one way, it's just studying the Bible, uh, looking at passages in scripture and what they talk about uh, a specific topic. And also we have in the Bible, the Bible teaches us how we should study God's word uh, it also gives us guidance. So we will go to the Bible and we will look at what the Bible teaches us and how we need to study uh, scripture. Okay, so if you can have your Bibles open and uh, would request some of you to read certain uh, scripture passages uh, and we'll go forward. Okay, so the first thing uh, is we should study with prayer. Okay, uh, can somebody read Psalm 119 verse 18? Psalm 119, verse 18. Can somebody read, please? Open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your law. Thank you, John. So here we, uh, the psalmist is praying uh, and asking God to open his eyes. Not that he's closing his eyes, uh, you know, it's uh, not a physical closing, but it's um, a, a spiritual opening of his spirit man, his spirit senses, uh, so that he's able to understand, he's able to see the deeper truths, the deeper revelations, uh, the profound uh, revelations and the truth in God's uh, word. So uh, even as we study systematic theology and we're studying the uh, you know, basic doctrines that are very foundational for our faith, uh, that is so important that, uh, you know, we are well grounded, well sure of so that we can teach that well, uh, we can um, uh, explain that well to others. It's important for us uh, when we come to class to just pray this short prayer and say, God, open my eyes that I may understand, may see the truth in your word. Uh, because when we see the truth, the truth uh, sets us free, as it says in God's word. Okay, uh, And we can also ask the Holy Spirit for his guidance. It's the Holy Spirit who uh, reveals God's truth for us. Uh, that's what uh, Jesus said in John chapter 16, reveals the truth to us and he will lead us into all truth. So the first way you study uh, systematic theology or you study any topic, you're, uh, you're, you have to preach or you have to teach somewhere or you have to do a Bible study. Anyways, just, you know, open with a word of prayer and ask God to help you. The second one is we need to study with humility. Why do we need to study with humility? Any ideas, any thoughts? 
Why do we need to study systematic theology with humility? No thoughts? Okay, um, for us, those of us who are studying systematic theology, we may learn a lot of uh, new things, you know, teachings about scripture uh, that may or may not be known by your family members or your Bible study group or your uh, uh, the believers in your church. Uh, or, you know, so even, you know, the elders or, um, or uh, even pastors who perhaps have forgotten uh, what they have learned uh, in theological college or they did not have the facility or the opportunity to go to a theological college, but they are just ministering uh, and the Holy Spirit is using them. So, you know, when we study systematic theology and we have a deeper insight and, uh, you know, we are open to uh, uh, and we are learning uh, more profound truths and deeper truths, uh, you know, it becomes easy for us to adopt an attitude of pride or superiority compared to others okay or sometimes we can even uh, uh, teach or preach um, you know um, simply to uh, mock others or to show others down or you know when we discuss with somebody who's a believer or in a bible study group or uh, you know or a pastor we can end up arguing because we think you know we've studied systematic theology we've gone through uh, you know uh, a certification course we've done two years or three years in a bible college we know much more than them they don't know uh, perhaps Perhaps what they're saying might be wrong, uh, but you know, um, there's a way that uh, we can um, teach them in a right attitude and not with an attitude of pride, saying that you know we know everything, uh, we're in a better position, and mocking them or laughing at them, uh, you know, or putting down a fellow a believer in the conversation that we are having with them, uh, or making uh, another believer in you know, feel insignificant in the Lord's work. So we need to be very careful about this. So even as we're studying systematic theology uh, or you're studying other uh, courses and you're getting deeper into God's word, learning so much more, let that bring in an attitude of humility in which you're willing to go and teach people, uh, you know, help them out, um, you know, uh, uh, get them to know the truth, even as they don't have the opportunity or the time to study in a Bible college. And so James tells us in James chapter 3, verses 13 and 17. So can somebody read that, please? James chapter 3, verses 13 and 17. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Thank you. So here, uh, uh, James is, um, you know, uh, telling us that one's understanding of scripture should be imparted in humility and in love. Okay, so even as we uh, go about uh, teaching or correcting people, let us do it in humility and in uh, love. The third thing how we should study uh, systematic theology is to study it with reason. Okay, so when we say we need to study it with reason, uh, what comes to your mind? Now, this is simple. Okay. You study it with reason, what comes to your mind? Something that I've already spoken uh, in the beginning of the class. So would like somebody like to throw some light on what you think is we need to study with reason? To teach more clearly the word of God. Okay, to teach more clearly the word of God. Thank you, Jeffina. How do you use reason to study God's word? What does it mean that we need to use reason? Defend, okay. To get clear understanding. 
to get a clearer understanding, okay? So when you're studying God's word, uh, you know, it's not, uh, uh, every time it's not the Holy Spirit just imparting to you or speaking to you, you use your mental faculties or you use your intellectual faculties, you use your mind, right? Yes or no? Yes, do you use your mind? And sometimes your mind begins to reason, to think, okay, uh, this is what it says here, but uh, this is what it says in the Old Testament, and you're trying to look back in the Old Testament, this is what I read some time back, this is what some preacher said. So you're trying to reason, okay? Uh, why is Paul saying that uh, women should be silent in the church? Uh, you're trying to reason and you know in our church women speak we have women pastors uh, uh, why is uh, uh, paul saying that women should be silent in church what does it mean so you're trying to reason you're trying to think you're trying to um, uh, look at different passages okay what does peter say about this what does jesus say about this what is uh, does it say in the old testament so you're trying to reason you're trying to use your mind of course god has given us our minds our intellectual uh, faculties that we need to use uh, to understand um, his word to understand him but even as we use our uh, reasoning abilities uh, to draw a conclusion or to draw an understanding about a specific passage or to bring out about some deductions uh, we need to be very careful that uh, you know we don't overstep our reasoning faculties um, you know but and contradict the clear teaching in God's word but even as we are using our uh, uh, intellect we need to be aligned uh, that needs to be aligned to God's uh, word and for that it's very important uh, for us to ask the Holy Spirit pray and ask the Holy Spirit uh, you know to speak to us uh, to guide our uh, reasoning and our thoughts in the right way okay so third thing we need to do is to study with a reason the fourth thing is uh, we should study with the help of others okay uh, get help from others now um when we say get help from others, uh, we also need to be careful about the right source that we are getting help from because we have a lot of um, uh, content that is available on the internet. Uh, so we need to be very careful about the sites that we go in, uh, what we are reading, um, because we have a lot of false teachings or false doctrines that are there. Uh, and we always uh, need to, um, uh, you know, if any preacher or teacher is teaching or we're reading something, we need to always validate that uh, teaching with the Word of God. Go back to the Word of God and see what it says in the Word of God and ask God to help you to understand if this is the truth, if this is uh, what uh, needs to be believed and to be upheld by uh, us in our faith walk with him so we need to be thankful that god has put teachers because paul says that in the church we have prophets apostles teachers uh and you know teachers are there to teach in the church and um you know we should allow those with gifts of teaching to help us to understand uh, scripture but having said that uh, we also don't blind, blindly just believe what people are saying so in the same note don't blindly just take everything that I'm saying uh, please read uh, please understand please uh, get back to me if uh, I say something that is not right or you think it's not right it's good to have a good time of discussion uh, uh, and make our class more lively okay so I can also learn from you all and you're all not just learning from me okay and the fifth thing is um, we should study by collecting and understanding all the relevant passages of scripture on any topic and i've already said this i'll repeat it again that we don't take and believe or f make a doctrine based on just one scripture but uh, you know scripture always uh, uh, you know uh, validates other scripture portions so we always need to go back to other scripture portions go back and forth old testament new testament uh, see what uh, the entire scripture is talking about one specific uh, topic okay so collect your understanding on all the relevant uh, 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 scripture passages and then come to a basic conclusion the sixth thing is we should study with rejoicing and uh, praise 
Okay, so study with rejoicing and praise. I know some of you getting up early in the morning at four. It's not very easy at four in the morning. Uh, some of our uh, students getting up so early to um, uh, to rejoice and praise. But, um, you know, we can uh, do that. Um, uh, don't say, oh, my gosh, this is so much for me to take. I can't understand. Uh, how am I going to study all this? Um, you know, just rejoice and praise and thank God for the revelations, the truth he's given us in his word, that we have the opportunity to study that. Um, and don't just study it because it's uh, as a theoretical exercise or something that you have to go through because you have to get a certificate course or you are put into this course uh, or something that, uh, you know, will give you more intellectual knowledge. Uh, but study it as, um, uh, as, uh, as the psalmist says in Psalm 139 verse 17. Can somebody read that, please? Psalm 113 verse 17. Anyone can read that? How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Yeah, so our response should be like, you know, uh, when we're studying about this living God, this great, mighty, awesome God, just, you know, uh, stand in awe of his wonders, his work, his creation, his redemption, and, uh, you know, all that he has um, revealed to us in scripture that we are able to uh, study. Okay, so these are the six things that we can keep in mind while we are studying uh, systematic theology or we're studying basically any topic in the uh, Bible. So any questions, any comments, anything you would like to say, any doubts? Anything that you all did not agree with me on? It's all clear? Yes, for now you are sounding very clear. So I think okay. the questions will come later when we when we follow you more. But okay. you are sounding very clear. Okay, thank you. Now we look at some of the prominent. Very... Sorry, yes, success. Go ahead. No, that's a very understanding. Very okay. understanding. Very good. Okay, thank you. So we look at what are the prominent uh, biblical doctrines. Uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, prominent biblical doctrines that the Bible teaches. The first one is bibliology, which is the doctrine of the... Any idea? Bibliology? Doctrine of the... Yes, Jeffina? Bible. Yes, it's a doctrine of the Bible. Thank you. Uh, theology is the doctrine of... God. God. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what is anthropology? Anthropos. Anthropology. Have you heard this word anthropos, those who are science students? Doctrine of man. Doctrine of man. Thank you. Anthropos is man. Hermatology. Hermatology is the doctrine of sin. Okay. Soteriology. Anything, anything that comes to your mind with the word yes, S, soteriology, doctrine of salvation, okay, an S in salvation, Christology, what is Christology? Christ. Yes, doctrine of Christ, thank you. Pneumatology, pneumatology. About Holy Spirit, man. Thank you. Holy Spirit, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Ecclesiology. Ecclesiology. The doctrine of the church. Okay. I'm sure you've heard this word eschatology. Eschatology. Have you heard about it? We are in that in such times now. In time. end times. Yes. Yeah. End times. Thank you. Uh, Anita and Jeffina, thank you. It's end times, so doctrine of um, uh, eschatology. Uh, eschatology is the doctrine of end times. And then the last one is angelology. 
I mean, that is very simple. What is angelology? Angels. <laughs> Angels, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, we have bibliology, theology, anthropology, hermatology, soteriology, Christology, pneumatology, ecclesiology, um, uh, eschatology, and angelology. Okay, so these are the doctrines that uh, uh, are there in the Bible. The Bible teaches us. We will look at um, these doctrines in the days to come. Okay, so that is the introduction for systematic theology. Do you all have any questions, any doubts? Anything you'd like to say? No? Very quiet class. Okay. No question. Okay. So we look at uh, the first doctrine, doctrine of the Bible, that is bibliology. Okay. Uh, that is the doctrine of the word of God. Okay. Now, uh, when we look at the uh, scriptures, scripture has uh, several different meanings about the word of God. Okay. So I'm sure you've read scripture, you've read the word of God uh, mentioned in scripture. So, or you've heard about it. And uh, so when you hear about the word of God, what are the several different meanings that comes to your mind about the word of God? The word of God has several different meanings in scripture, so. Yeah, so in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So I okay. believe apart from the word, there is no God. Okay, so in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. In the beginning was Logos and the Logos was Theos with Theos. Okay, so um, the word of God, which is referring to whom? The word is referring to? To Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, thank you. What else? So when we think about the word of God, what else comes to your mind in scripture? The word of God is a life and it's a light. Okay, it's life and it's light. Yes, thank you. That means it gives life to us. It guides our paths. Wonderful, thank you. Anything else comes to your mind when you think about the word of God? Okay, the word of God is like it's, it's like a sword is sharper as, and pierces the heart of man. Okay, it's uh, like a sword that uh, pierces the heart of uh, uh, of a man. Okay, have you read in scripture the word of the Lord? A word of God came to so and so. The word of God came to Jeremiah. So, what does it mean? The word of God came to Isaiah. What does that mean? It means the voice or speech by God. Yes, thank you. So basically it means, uh, you know, uh, uh, God was speaking to Isaiah. God was speaking to uh, Jeremiah, uh, imparting certain things, pronouncing judgment, announcing things, declaring things, guiding, giving laws, commandments. So it's uh, the word of God can also be the speech of uh, God. It can be something that God is personally speaking to um, somebody. The word of the Lord came to prophet Nathan, go and tell uh, David, you know, what he has done, you know. Uh, so it can be also a word of personal address that God is uh, speaking. Uh, uh, when, it, when we also read about uh, the word of God and we can also see, see that, you know, uh, you know, God put his word in, in uh, uh, in Isaiah's mouth or in Jeremiah's mouth, so God just speaking through uh, people. So uh, we see several um, writ, uh, uh, meanings of God's word in uh, Scripture. So we look at those several uh, meanings. We look at a few. We just have about ten minutes. Um, so the first one, like uh, Jefina said, the word of God uh, is as a person. 
okay, as a person that is Jesus Christ, the word Logos referring to uh, Jesus Christ. And this we read in John chapter 1, verses 1 and verse 14. So can somebody read that, please? John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And uh, can somebody, so we see that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So here it's basically referring to uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, can somebody read? A, uh, can somebody read? Sorry, Revelation chapter nineteen, verse thirteen. Revelation chapter nineteen, verse thirteen. And he was clothed with a vesture deep in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Yeah, thank you. So here it says he was clothed with a rope dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. So here referring to Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3, please. Can somebody read that? 1 John chapter 1 verses 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. So here we see that um, it's here talking about the word of life, referring to Jesus Christ. Now we need to have this clarity that, you know, in, in Scripture, uh, there are several places where we see the word, word, W-O-R-D. Now wherever there is a small W for the word, word, it just means it's it's a saying, an utterance, or uh, uh, it's a declaration. Okay, uh, uh, the words that comes from God's mouth, or uh, what God is saying, or speaking, or from a person's mouth. Okay, but when we see a capital W, it's always referring to the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Word, because we saw that in John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So there. When we see that capital W, it's when it's translated in Greek, it's much more easier because it talks about logos, okay, word, okay. And um, so here the word of life, uh, with the life was manifested, we have seen and bear witness and declare to you. So here we, uh, John is writing and talking about Jesus who, uh, you know, God becoming flesh and who they have seen, who they bear witness to his life and what he has uh, done. So uh, the first uh, meaning of the word of God in scripture we can see is, uh, uh, is the person of Jesus Christ. Now we can also see that the word of God also means the speech by God. Okay. It can also mean speech of God or speech by God. So it can mean God's decrees. It can mean God's personal addressed to a certain person. It can also mean that he's speaking and he's giving out the laws, the commandments uh, that uh, was needed for uh, his people. So we look at um, uh, the word of God as the speech by God. Uh, the first one under the speech by God is God's decrees. So a decree can be uh, anything like an announcement, a judgment, or a declaration of God. Um, and it's a word of God that causes what he has spoken to happen. Okay. So when we talk about God's decrees, we're basically talking about his judgment, his declaration and his announcement. And we're saying that, you know, with whatever God speaks, his spoken word, whatever he has spoken will happen. Okay. So God's word takes the form of a powerful decree 
decree that ca can cause events to happen or even cause things to come into being or come into existence. So whatever he speaks is so powerful that will come into existence, will come into being. And um, we can look at uh, a very familiar passage in Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. So can somebody read that please? Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. Thank you. Um, we see that God says, let there be, and there was an effect. You know, what he spoke came into being, came into existence. It caused things to happen. And it says, and God said, let there be, and it was so. Okay. So we see that God's word is powerful. Uh, his words are creative words. Um, uh, and these powerful creative words of God are often called as God's decrees and uh, whatever God decreases whatever he says you know is so powerful that it will happen it will cause things to come into being come into uh, existence okay the second one is you know God's word which is uh, meaning speech of God can also mean his personal address okay so God uses human words or language to communicate with his people or to communicate people on earth by speaking directly to them so these are God's word of personal address uh, an example we can see is in Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 to 17 so can somebody read that please Genesis 2 16 and 17 But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you are sure to die. Okay, thank you. So here we see that, um, you know, God is speaking to whom here? Who is he speaking to here? Adam. Adam and Eve, yes. And he's telling them, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but you can... You can eat of it freely, but you cannot eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you eat it, you will surely die. So here is a personal address or a personal speech or something that God is communicating to uh, man and woman in, his, uh, in, 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 in a way uh, that they can understand. Okay, so that is uh, a second meaning of the word of God is the speech of God. Okay. We'll stop here um, and we'll continue in the next class. So if anyone has anything you have to say, any questions, any doubts, anything that, um, you know, brought light to you this morning, um, something that you had doubts about, something that you understood. Um, I just want to say it's quite interesting. That's, hmm. you know, when you said the small W, it's about declaration, capital W is about Jesus Christ. And it's quite interesting to learn very deeper and I'm learning this. Thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else? No? Okay, then we'll end class for today. Thank you for um, uh, joining us. Have a a blessed day for those of you who it's evening time or night time. Uh, good night. Uh, have a good night's rest. And I'll see you all uh, on Friday. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. We are <laughs> grateful. Thank you, success. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Jeffina. Thank Bye, you everyone. Much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.